Good morning, friends. But even the most superbly successful of these theatrical productions was expensive and troublesome, and Stalin decided not to use open trials any longer. Or rather, in 1937, he probably did have a plan for holding public trials on a wide scale in the local districts, so the black soul of the opposition would be made visible to the masses. But he couldn't find procedures who were good enough, producers who were good enough. It wasn't practical to prepare things so carefully, and the mental processes of the accused weren't so complex, and Stalin only got into a mess, although very few people knew about it. The whole plan broke down after a few trials and was abandoned. It's appropriate here to describe one such trial, the Katie case, detailed reports of which the Ivanovo provincial newspapers published initially. In the end of 1934, a new local administrative district was created in the remote wilds of Inivo, Ivanovo province, at the point where it joined Kostroma and Nizhny, Novgorod provinces, and its center was situated in the ancient, slow-moving village of Katy. New leaders were sent there from various local localities, and they made one another's acquaintance right in Katy. There they found a remote, sad, impoverished region, badly in need of money, machines, and intelligent economic management, but instead starved by grain procurements. It happened that Fyodor Ivanovich Smirnov, the first secretary of the district party committee, was a man with a strong sense of justice. Stavrov, the head of the district agricultural department, was a peasant through and through, one of those peasants known as the Intens Intensive Intensive Nikki. In other words, the hard-working, zealous, and literate peasants who in the 20s had run their farms on a scientific basis, for which they were at the time rewarded by the Soviet government, since it had not yet decided that these intensive Nikki must be destroyed. Because Stavrov had entered the party, he had survived the liquidation of the Kulaks, and maybe he even took part in the liquidation of the Kulaks. These men tried to do something for the peasants in their new district, but directives kept pouring down from above, and each one ran counter to some initiative of theirs. It was as if up there they were busy thinking what they could do to make things worse and worse despite des worse and more desperate for the peasants. And at one point, the leaders in Katy wrote the province leadership that it was necessary to lower the plan of pre procurement of bread grains because the district couldn't fulfill the plan without becoming impoverished, well below the danger point. One has to recall the situation in the 30s, and maybe not only the 30s, to realize that sacrilege against the plan and what rebellion against the government this represented. But in accordance with then-current style, measures were not taken directly from above, but were left to local initiative. When Smirnov was on vacation, his deputy, Vasily Fyodorovich Romanov, the second secretary, arranged to have a resolution passed by the district party committee. The successes of the district would have been even more brilliant if it were not for Trotskyite Stavrov. This set in motion the individual case of Stavrov, an interesting approach, divide and rule. For the time being, Smirnov was merely to be frightened, neutralized, and compelled to retreat. There would be time enough later on to get to him, and this, on a small scale, was precisely the Stalinist tac tactic in the Central Committee. At stormy party meetings, however, it became clear that Stavrov was about as much of a Trotskyite as he was a Jesuit. The head of the district consumer cooperatives, Vasily Grigorievich Lazov, a man with a ragtag, haphazard education, but one of those native talents other Others were so surprised to find among Russians. A born retail trade executive, eloquent, adroit in an argument, who could get fired to red heat about anything he believed to be right, tried to persuade the party meeting to expel Romanov from the party for slander. And they actually did give Romanov an official party rebuke. Romanov's last words in this dispute were typical of this kind of person, demonstrating his assurance in regard to the general situation. Even though they proved Strav Stavrov was not a Trotskyite, nonetheless, I am sure he is a Trotskyite, the party will investigate, and it will also investigate the rebuke to me. And the party did investigate. 
The district and KVD arrested Stavrov almost immediately, and one month later they also arrested Univar, the chairman of the district executive committee, and an Estonian. When Romanov took over Univar's job as chairman of the district executive committee, Stavrov was taken to the provincial NKV NKVD, where he, con he confessed he was a Trotskyite that he had acted in coalition with the SRs all his life, and that he was a member of an underground rightist organization in his district. This is a bouquet worthy of the times. The only thing missing being a connection to the intent. To the Entente. Entente. Perhaps he never really did confess these things, but no one is ever going to know, since he died from torture during interrogation in the internal prison of the Ivanovo NKVD. The pages of his disposition were there in full. Soon afterward, they arrested Smirnov as secretary of the district party committee as the head of the supposed rightist organization, and Subarov, the head of the district financial department, and someone else as well. Of interest is the way in which Vlasov's fate was decided. He had only recently demanded the expulsion from the party of Romanov, now the new chairman of the district executive committee. He had also fa fatally offended Rusov, the district prosecutor, as we have already reported in Chapter 4 above, he had offended N.I. Krylov, the chairman of the district NKVD, by protect protecting two of his energetic and resourceful executives from being arrested for supposed wrecking. Both of them had black marks on their records because of their social origins. Vlasov always hired all kinds of former people for his work because they mastered the business effectively and in addition tried hard. People promoted from the ranks of the proletariat knew nothing and, more importantly, didn't want to know anything. Nevertheless, the NKVD was prepared to make its peace with the trade cooperative. Sorokin, the deputy chairman of the district NKVD, came in person to see Vlasov with a peace propo proposal to give the NKVD 700 rubles worth of materials without charging them for it, and later on we will somehow write it off, the rag pickers, and that was two months' wages for Vlasov who had never taken anything illegally for himself. And if you don't give it to us, you are going to regret it. Vlasov kicked him out. How do you dare offer me, a communist, a deal like that? The very next day, Krylov paid a call to the District Consumer Cooperative, this time as the representative of the District Committee of the Party. This masquerade, like all these tricks, was in the spirit of 1937, and this time he ordered the convening of a party meeting, the Agenda, on the wrecking activities of Smirnov and Univar in the consumers' cooperatives, the report to be delivered by Comrade Vlasov. Well, now, that's a gem of a trick for you. No one at that point was making charges against Vlasov. But it would be quite enough for him to say two little words about the wrecking activities of the former secretary of the district party committee in his Vlasov's field, and the NKVD would interrupt. And where were you? Why didn't you come to us in time? In a situation of this sort, many others would have lost their heads and allowed themselves to be trapped, but not Vlasov. He immediately replied, I won't make the report. Let Krylov make the report. After all, he arrested Smirnov and Univar and is handling their case. Krylov refused. I am not familiar with the evidence. Vlasov replied, If even you aren't familiar with the evidence, that means they were arrested without cause. So the party meeting simply didn't take place. But how often do people dare to defend themselves? We will not have a complete picture of the atmosphere of 1937 if we lose sight of the fact that there were still strong-willed people capable of difficult decisions. And if we fail to recall that late that night, T, the senior bookkeeper of the district consumer cooperative, and his deputy N, came to Vlasov's office with 10,000 rubles. Vasily Grigorievich, get out of town tonight. Don't wait for tomorrow. Otherwise, you are finished. Vlasov thought it did not befit a communist to run away. The next morning, there was a nasty article in the district paper on the work of the district consumer cooperative. One has to point out that in 1937, the press always played hand in, hand in glove with the NKVD. By evening, Vlasov had been asked to give the district party committee an accounting of his own work. Every step of the way, this was how things were in the entire Soviet Union. This was 1937, the second year of the so-called Mykayan prosperity in Moscow and other big cities, and even today in the reminiscences of journalists and writers, one gets the impression that at the time there was already plenty of everything. This concept seems to have gone down in history, and there is a danger of its staying there. 
and yet in November 1936, two years after the abolition of bread rationing, a secret directive was published in Ivanovo province and in other provinces prohibiting the sale of flour. In those years, many housewives in small town, housewives in small towns and particularly in villages still used to bake their own bread. Prohibiting the sale of flour meant do not eat bread. In the district center of Katy, long bread lines formed such as had never be before been seen. However, they attacked that problem too by forbidding the baking of black bread in district centers, permitting only expensive white bread to be baked. The only bakery in the whole Katy district was the one in the district center, and people began to pour into the center from the villages to get black bread. The warehouses of the district consumer cooperative had flour, and the two parallel prohibitions blocked off all avenues by which it could be made available to the public. Vlasov, however, managed to find a way out of the impasse, and despite the clever government rulings, he kept the district fed for a whole year. He went out to the collective farms and got eight of them to agree to set up public bakeries in empty kulak huts. In other words, they would simply bring in firewood and set the women to baking in ordinary Russian peasant ovens, but mind you, ovens which were now socialized, publicly, not privately owned. The district consumer cooperative would undertake to supply them with flour. This is eternal simplicity to a solution, once it has been discovered. There is eternal simplicity to a solution, once it has been discovered. Without building any bakeries, for which he had no funds, Vlasov set them up one day. Without carrying on a, a trade in flour, he released flour from the warehouse continually and proceeded to order more for, from the provincial center. Without selling black bread in the district center, he gave the district black bread. Yes, he did not violate the letter of the instructions, but he violated their spirit. For their essence was to compel a re reduction in flour consumption by the starving people. And so, of course, there were, there were good grounds for criticizing him at the district party committee. Have a good day, friends.